Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. Special guest in studio today. She's the host of Empire Fires on the Telser English Network. You can see it on YouTube. She's right here. It's Abby Martin, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Abby. How hey, are you? Hey, great to be here. Now, everybody, I'm sure, who watches this show is familiar with your work. It's amazing. So I watched what she does, and she actually informs people. Uh, she <laughs> informs me. Uh, she, what I like to refer to as talk smart. And uh, <laughs> and she really knows what she's talking about. She exposes uh, what the United States government's really doing all around the world. And she tells you about stuff that nobody else will tell you about, which is the kind of news shows we like. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Love the show. So you're not... Uh a Russian uh, bot? You're not doing Russian propaganda? I, I always thought you worked for RT. You look so Russian. I mean, Putin, you know, is no longer telling me what to do and say, so I have a little bit more liberation, but I still <laughs> am not sure if I'm a bot. I'm accused of being a bot every day from, like, a multitude of people, so it's quite a, it's quite an interesting time that we're living in. So tell people about your show, uh, Empire Files. It's, I, you know, every time I watch it, it's, you can't stop watching it. It's one of those, like, oh, oh. and, um... So tell about how did the show come about and what is your mission? So kind of paying homage to the untold history of the United States from Oliver Stone's uh, chapters, unarchiving lost chapters of American history and what the U.S. government has done to destabilize and destroy um, other nations and people for, you know, its existence as an empire. I think that history has been written by the victors until kind of the advent of social media. So for the longest time, we haven't really seen history be retold through the eyes of the marginalized and oppressed and those who are really affected by these policies. So every week on Telesaur, we present um, either an in-depth interview with someone or a documentary. And so we've done documentaries from Palestine, from Venezuela, trying to counter the regime change propaganda from the corporate media. And really, Telesaur was created as an apparatus to counter that hegemonic corporate media dominance in the world. Um, And so I'm really honored to be a part of that challenge to the narrative. And so what would be some of the work you're most proud of? My God. I mean, there's so many amazing things that I'm proud of um, that we've done in the show. Like I said, going on location. You know, you can stand in the studio all day like I did at RT and talk about Palestine. But until you're really there and seeing what is happening firsthand, I feel like um, I was missing out really on reporting. So that series I'm extraordinarily proud of. So what did what did see to me to go there would be overwhelming. Yeah. And I wouldn't know what to do. So how how did you react when you went to Palestine? I, we just... Well, another great thing is not being part of a network like RT. I have just the total liberty to go and do, you know, stay for a month somewhere and really just, mm-hmm. you know, I visited hundreds of families um, who all really knew about me because very rarely do you see Western journalists covering Palestine in a fair way. So it was, right. it was I was more famous in Palestine than I've ever been anywhere mm-hmm. around the world. But no, just talking to people and just listening. Um, because we don't really listen. We like to react instead of kind of, you know, understanding things and and, and uh, having the responsibility to really understand before we just react to everything. But I think everything in the world, Jimmy, needs to be seen in the context of the U.S. empire. We are the largest, most destructive uh, empire in the world. That's why I love your show and how you constantly call attention to the military budget, because all this shit doesn't matter. Like every domestic issue has to be seen through the lens of the empire. Every international issue has to be seen through the lens of the empire because the world is split into colonized and colonizers and and the riches that have been accumulated through the, the first world nations have been on the backs of those countries that have been colonized. So the framing of, you know, the context of world issues has to be seen through that lens. Uh, people don't realize, we just had Judah Friedlander on the show, who's one of my favorite comedians from 30 Rock, and he said as he traveled around the world, he he got to see uh, history from a different perspective. He said, you know, when you're in Vietnam, they don't call it the Vietnam War. (laughs) 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 He says they call it the war with the Americans. Right. So that's, a you never, ooh, so, and then you talk about how we're fighting terrorism Yet there is no doubt that we are the biggest cause. We are the biggest purveyors of terrorism in the world. Look what we did to Iraq alone. Oh my God. And no one ever talks about that. Could you imagine if another country, an Arab country, took over America, occupied right. it, killed hundreds of thousands of people? What? That's real terror. That's what we did. Right. Yeah, when I when I when I talk about like dropping the nuclear bombs, for example, and going to the Hiroshima Museum in, in Japan and, and really understanding the horrors of, of that we inflicted there, and people will justify and be like, Well, they shouldn't have bombed Pearl Harbor. And it's like, well, is that so does that give Mexico the justification to nuke us? Like, <laughs> where does the logic end? 
Because right. we did this to Afghanistan, that means that this other country can just drop nuclear bombs on us. Like that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> So it's it's a very disturbing American exceptionalism that we have to really, uh, you know, myths underpin our society. And the myth of American exceptionalism is the most destructive one of all. The fact that we think that it's OK that we drop nuclear bombs, that we invaded and occupied sovereign nations, that we continue to destabilize and overthrow leaders who uh, who their people have elected them to lead and to create a different direction for their country. So we've undermined and usurped the sovereignty and the future of, of countless people. So I like to re- tell people that what American exceptionalism means is that everybody gets to have health care except the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how it works, right? Everyone signs on the climate agreement and except us. Yeah. Because we're good. We're better. Except us. We're better right. than everyone. So, I, you know, it's crazy to hear people. Um, yeah, you know, people have no idea. Why are we friends with Saudi Arabia and not Iran? Right. right? Why? Why? Why are we even enemies with Iran? Why don't they like us? Well, it's because we overthrew their government and we installed the Shah, and they rebelled against that. Right. So that's just like, uh, why are we friends with Saudi Arabia? Because of the petrodollar. Now I make a big deal out of the petrodollar on my show. Maybe too big of a deal. I don't think you can though, because that's the cause of most of our foreign wars is because of Saudi Arabia, and John Kerry even admitted this in open testimony in, in the Senate where he said Saudi Arabia offered to pay for us if we would invade Syria and overthrow Assad. They offered to pay for the entire thing, which is what they've been doing all along anyway. So why do you think uh, people don't understand what's going on? Or do you think people in the United States do understand what's going on, except there's no mechanism to influence our government? Very well said. I think it's the latter. I'm hoping it's the latter. I think that Trump was, in, in, in a sense, a big fuck you to the establishment aside from a lot of other obvious reasons why he won. But I think that people do realize that's why trust in mainstream media is at an all-time low. That's why alternative media is on the rise. And I think that's why Trump kind of did double down on the anti-interventionist rhetoric. I will say rhetoric because he has been completely the opposite um, as president. But I think that he was playing into the fact that people are sick of the U.S. empire, military interventions around the world. I don't think they know how bad it is. I don't think they know that we have 900 bases, military personnel in almost every single country. And that the countries that you're talking about, like people understand the hypocrisy. Why are we friends with Saudi Arabia and enemies with Iran. Well, it's every country that doesn't bow to U.S. corporations and U.S. business interests. It's very obvious. So I think people see through the facade, but they don't know, like you said, what mechanism to change it because it's so futile to engage in electoral politics. Um, but as the recent elections showed, maybe that's not the case, Jimmy. Well, we'll, we'll see. We're going to get into that in just a second. You know, the reason why I have a show... You know, I I was a nightclub comedian uh, for 25 years or whatever, and then I started doing this show, and it was because the news shows that I normally turn to for information had let me down. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even the newspapers, right? The New York Times, the Washington Post, they all beat the drum for war. In fact, they shamed people who uh, ran against the narrative, the official government narrative, that we have to go to war with Iraq. They, they shouted you down and said that you were crazy. And so that's why I started doing the show, because I, I saw that those people were crazy. MSNBC was supposed to be lefty liberal, fired Phil Donahue when he had the highest rated show on the network because he wouldn't go along with the war machine, right? And they fired Ed Schultz because he wouldn't go along with the TPP. So I'm doing this show because of how bad the, the news media is. And people don't re- people think they get their information when they watch Rachel Maddow or CNN. Uh, do you feel the same way? That's why you're doing your show outside of the mainstream news media, because it's so horrible uh, and no one's telling the truth that you had to do this. That's how I felt. Oh, absolutely. People say, why did you join RT? I'm like, because I had to tell this story and I had to talk about the false uh, Democratic Republican paradigm and talk about how empire is consistent and these policies are consistent. And that was the only network that would allow me to do that, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Um, so people don't really understand the limitations and whether it be self censorship a lot of these people like Piers Morgan, they were cultivated in that position because they know to never yes. buck the establishment. They're not just chosen. I mean, what I what I showed through RT, and this is what I tell a lot of people, I paved editorial freedom that people choose not to do on mainstream media because then you'd see people like Jank Uger who are who stepped down or are fired, Phil Donahue who was fired for speaking out. I mean, that's what happens when you actually do buck your boss and who is paying 
for your show. So let's say, you know, MSNBC and all these big conglomerate news agencies that are run by they have fucking advertisements for Boeing. Like who is buying a tank and a jet? You know, like no one. It's just kind of a soft kind of like direction where these people and the anchors just know they can't really go there. They know who's paying the network. They know who's who the advertiser is. So it's not it's it's just a vehicle. It's a vehicle for ads. It hasn't been about news for a long time. And and this cultivation of the Russia phobia thing is the most bizarre um kind of fear-mongering campaign I've seen and I'm not that old, but holy shit. It's like a mass hallucinatory psychosis. I mean, you have people on who are the Trump Trump brown shirt army basically saying, you know, everything's fake news that doesn't worship Trump. But God's sake, I mean, you look at the mainstream media and everything's Russia, Russia, Russia. So I feel like I'm actually losing my goddamn mind because I'm I'm caught in the middle trying to make sense of it all. Uh, I feel the same <laughs> way because even people who I'm affiliated with on the left are pushing the Russian narrative. And I have to remind people that 90% of Americans want some kind of gun control. We ain't getting it. It has nothing to do with Russia. Right. 80% wanted a public option. We didn't get it. it has nothing to do with Russia. 70, 60 to 70% of people want some kind of public... Uh, uh, they want Medicare for all. We ain't getting it. Free college, they want it. We ain't getting it. Everybody wants to end the wars. They ain't ending. That has got nothing to do with Russia. Right. That is the people who are screwing you over is not Russia. The people who are screwing you over is Wall Street, the military industrial complex, big pharma, and fossil fuels. And that's why they, Boeing has... Uh, n- commercials on Meet the Press, not because people who are watching that are going to buy a jet, and <laughs> it's because they're not funding their investigations, they're funding their non-investigations. Right. That's what that is. Here's some money, shut up. Why does Archer Daniel Mindlin, why do they are advertise on Meet the Press? Because they don't want them to investigate them. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's the re- re- reason why half the country doesn't believe in climate change. It's because it's still presented on corporate media as a debate. And right. why is it presented that way? Because they're funded by fossil fuel companies. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Very so, simple. Yes. Yeah, and then you have general after general talking about why we do need war with North Korea, but here's here's how it needs to be carried out, right? Yes. I mean, there's no so Room the framing for... is always we need war, mm-hmm. and then we're gonna dis- de- we're gonna debate tactics. They never go well. Let's bring on someone who says we don't need the war. They never do that. Yeah. Why why don't you ever see Medea Benjamin on, on TV? <laughs> Only to mock her if they right. ever do bring her on. Uh, why don't we? You never see. You never see union leaders. You never see anybody who's anti-war. You always see generals who are being paid by the military-industrial mm-hmm. complex. You know, I try to remind people that the real sin that Brian Williams made wasn't puffing off his war record, right? He said that he took enemy fire, and then M- NBC threw him under the bus, and then he said that bus took rocket fire. The point is, Brian Williams used to bring on generals onto his news show to give us a straight dope about what was happening in Iraq so we could make a decision about it as an informed electorate. What he didn't tell us is those generals were being paid by the military-industrial complex, and they were always advocating for more wars, sometimes specific kinds of military artillery that, that we should be uh, buying. The guy who told us that won a Pulitzer Prize for it in the New York Times. Brian Williams still didn't tell us, right? So that's what's wrong with the news media. We're being given what we think is objective facts, but we're not getting We're getting it from General Electric, which was a defense contractor. That's who he worked for. And he was bringing on guys working for military contractors and not telling you. So to me, that's the big sin. It's still happening, by the way. That's still They still bring on these generals who are in the pocket, because most of the generals you know leave the military. Where do they go, Abby? Oh, they go back in in the system. I mean, they just cycle through. Yeah, it's they start to go work from yeah for and, the military industrial yeah. complex. They go to work as consultants or just and lobbyists. All yeah. Yes. So, do you see us getting people don't even realize because they didn't get reported? The Democrats join the Republicans to spend eighty billion dollars more a year on the military. Military and, didn't and even ask that, for it. In that package, this is amazing. It was essentially a John McCain bill, five hundred million dollars to train Ukrainian forces against Russian aggression. What what does that mean? Neo-Nazis? Like right? are we just giving five hundred million dollars to neo-Nazis in Ukraine now? Like yep. that? We already we already like backed the coup. That's not enough. Right. Oh, but don't forget the seven hundred and fifty billion or I'm sorry, million for Israel's defense. Right. Because they need another, you know, billion dollars more. So that kind of got earmarked through. So this Russia thing, do you think uh, so how does something like this start, in your opinion? Like, to me, this came—this was hatched by Robbie Mook and John Podesta, 
And then there are minions uh, who have an overly emotional reaction to Trump, meaning everybody at MSNBC Mm -hmm. and CNN. They all just bit into it, and now they have an emotional attachment to this story that is factless. You talk about pushing conspiracies. That's what this is, right? This is a big conspiracy. It's a huge conspiracy, but I saw it back because I worked at RT three years prior to all all these conspiracies were formulating. So I kind of saw it. I mean, we saw it with Al Jazeera. They were calling it the terrorist network. Remember bin Laden's mouthpiece? It was totally um, mm. basically marginalized as an alternative news source. This was after 9-11, of course. But then I saw the same thing happening as Russia became more, uh, you know, more of a fear mongering tactic from the establishment and started presenting RT as an actual alternative news source that was criticizing empire, criticizing U.S. corporations, hosting people like me on there. They didn't like that at all, Jimmy. So I saw it back then cultivating. Um, I saw the hysteria. I saw when I was there um, and spoke out um, about the network's coverage of the Crimea intervention, I saw a House of Cards style like PSYOP happen against me in D.C. from Bill Crystal's think tank. They had uh, someone named Liz Wall come out right after me, come out and quit live on air. Um, and then she she got kind of carted around with Bill Crystal's henchmen to say RT was a pro- Putin propaganda network. And I quit. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa. So I saw kind of a lot of people behind the scenes that were those deep state actors already had RT in the crosshairs. That was for sure. So after leaving and then seeing all of this come to a head where they have no one to blame but themselves for Trump and they have to have an enemy, right? But we were all waiting with bated breath. What's the proof? What's the proof? So, of course, when the DNI report came out, we were all waiting. What's it going to be? Well, um, unfortunately, for the people who haven't read it, you might want to, um, especially if you believe in this concocted narrative, because half of the report, first of all, it was a four-year-old report. Some fucking intern could have done a better job in two hours just watching RT and updating that. So that shows you how little they really care about putting these propaganda narratives together. But half the report was talking about RT's coverage, my show. They said that I was fomenting radical discontent, that simply my coverage and RT's coverage of third parties, Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, greed, that is what fomented the discontent. That is what cultivated um, the support for Trump. Interesting. 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 So basically in a country where half the people are poor, talking about real issues, talking about how half half the country doesn't have more than $1,000 in savings, that's Russian propaganda. That's the, that's that's what cost the election, apparently, to these people. So it pisses me off to no end talking about real issues, Jimmy. I didn't say one thing praising Putin. I don't. There's so many radical like socialists and leftists at the network who do it because they know that there's nowhere else that they can talk about these issues. There's uh, there is no place else that uh, I mean, look, we try to do it here. They're suppressing these videos. Uh, unfortunately, even the left is pushing. The, it's the, coming from the left this time. This McCarthyism, this it is. Russia, it's crazy. I used to talk, of course, Bill Chris. Well, it's weird now. The party, you know, when Hillary Clinton was running uh, in the general, all these people like Bill Crystal, all these. Well, I'm going to support Hillary and David Frum, and now so now the mm-hmm. Democratic Party mm-hmm. has officially become the party. Of, or, or how about Josh Barrow when he the guy when he announced that he was uh, leaving the Republican Party? It's like this is what finally did it. Trump, it, the Iraq War. So now the Democratic Party is officially the party of people who voted for George W. Bush twice. Yeah, what do you think about? Uh, People like Keith Olbermann who just apologized to George W. I Bush. I can't even fucking believe it. Keith Olbermann was one of my heroes Me during too. the Bush administration. I, I lived for his rants. He was even going out there and saying stuff about the anthrax attacks. I mean, he was hardcore. I don't know what the hell is going on with this lionization of Bush. Bush killed a million people. He tortured people. He created a gulag. That's still in, in effect. He deserves to be rotting in prison um, for the rest of his life, not painting fucking portraits of dogs and his dick in the bathtub. I mean, this is insane saying that this person is paraded around as some old sage. I remember when he went on the Oprah show. This is before even Trump was in office. He was on the Oprah show and she was holding his hands like like some old sage yeah. like Buddha. Give me your advice. Yeah. It's like this person is a fucking a war, war criminal. criminal. I mean, going back to the whole American exceptionalism thing. These people are war criminals. The U.S. is polled consistently as the greatest threat to world peace over and over and over again. 
I mean, and, and that's when I knew Obama was a fake because I was like, well, of course he has to prosecute these war criminals if we ever want to have some sort of retribution. I was like, oh, OK. So that's when I knew things were on a very, very dark path. But that's what happens when you let war criminals walk free. I mean, it just becomes normalized and continues to be a normal thing in our society, Jimmy. And now we have uh, Trump. <laughs> and, you know, a bipartisan consensus on war and torture and American empire. Well, it's not good when you have a narcissist who knows that he will get basically people applauding him when he bombs people. So that's what we're seeing happen. Yeah. So that's what it took for people to call Donald Trump president was when he finally started yeah. bombing people yeah. and getting down. Brian Williams almost nutted in his pants over it. So <laughs> it was, uh, you know. If Keith Olbermann, if it took Donald Trump getting elected to his first term for Keith Olbermann to apologize to George Bush, what if he gets elected to a second term? Is he going to start apologizing to Nixon? <laughs> what, is, what is this? Like, that's this thing of they're trying to separate Trump away from the Republicans. No, right. they are all right. Paul Ryan is sticking with Trump. He said his agenda is our agenda. Of course it is. So this so. I keep seeing Democrats like Hillary Clinton and people like Keith Olbermann trying to say that Trump is this unique menace. Why is he's more of a unique menace than Dick Cheney? I think he's less of a menace because he shoots himself in the foot three times before he even gets out of bed in the morning and he can't get his legislative agenda implemented, right? He couldn't repeal Obamacare, couldn't implement his own health care. Every time he does a Muslim ban, they stop it in the courts and now his tax plan seems under duress. So what do you say to the people who say, mm -hmm. I want Mike Prince, I want to impeach him, I want Mike Pence? Yeah, I want, I want a Christian ISIS who says to execute gay people en masse, right? I mean, Mike Pence is a Christian ISIS. He really is a psychotic person. Look, I think that on one hand, you wouldn't have kind of this cult of personality behind Mike Pence, obviously, because he's just a fucking, he looks like a bust, like a statue. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even, I even seen like have an expression. He is very disturbing, but I think that, I do think that Trump does have this kind of effect on people in a different way where we see the whipping up of, you know, fervor. Now I'm called a, a dirty commie or a Nazi collaborator. It's like <laughs> there's very uh, few gray area to, like, try to create dialogue with people these days. So I do blame Trump for that, for uh, affecting society in that way. However, um no, I think that Trump is not an aberration. I think that he he's just showing the face of who we are, right? And I think that the Christian evangelicals love him because they never would have been able to get in power without someone to be the forefront. They've been trying for decades. So these Pences and the DeVosses, they love that he can be like the fall guy while they're just ramming shit through. Um, but I think that Trump, it, it makes perfect sense looking back, and I kind of forget where what your question was originally, but it makes sense looking back. He is the worst elements of all, everything horrible about our society. Reality stardom, celebrity dumb, this, this billionaire, uh, total narcissistic personality disorder. I mean, it completely makes sense. I'm shocked that I didn't see it and predict it before. But what was your question originally? My totally question forgot. was, there's a lot of people saying that Mike Pence, they want to oh, impeach him and get Mike better. Pence. And, you know, even... Keith Olbermann said that on the View the other day that that our, right. that we were talking about his his interview and Joy Behar had to be the voice of reason. But Joy Behar famously said to Bernie Sanders, "The Iraq War was a long time ago. Get over it." She was the voice of reason <laughs> with Keith Olbermann the other day when he goes, "Don't you want a boring president like Mike Pence?" And she goes, "Not with those policies." And then he goes, yeah, but his policies will be... He was trying to find common ground yeah. with Meghan McCain, and he said, uh, we can oh, agree right. on getting rid of Trump, and we would be okay with Mike Pence. And Joy Bear is like, no. Yeah, no. It's disgusting. And so that's how... It's like this... You know, they called it Bush derangement disorder, mm -hmm. then they called it Obama derangement disorder. This is really uh, Donald Trump derangement disorder. Donald Trump is a... We dodged a bullet, in a sense. Do you agree with this? This is what I say, is that we dodged a bullet because... The, this voting for lesser of two evils left people wanting to break the establishment. And the good thing was that we got a guy like a demagogue like Trump who's incompetent. If we would, if we would, maybe we could have got someone worse who's actually can get his shit done, like Mike Pence or Ted Cruz or someone who's actually horrible who can implement his agenda. But we kind of dodged a bullet this time with Donald Trump. And now the progressives have a chance to reorganize and kind of try to take over government. So do you think that we did dodge a bullet with Donald Trump or what do you think? A couple of things. I think 
think going back to your first point, I think that the system doesn't like Trump because he is a crazy, like you said, a demagogue. He is uh, completely unhinged. Right. So for the empire, it doesn't look very good. They tried very hard to rebrand the empire after Bush. Yeah. Bush was kind of the same way where we were at the brink, I felt like, of a full blown like revolution. I mean, at the end of his administration, Obama placates people back, continues the policies of empire. Then you see Trump again. I think that the reason why the, quote, deep state doesn't like Trump is because he's making it very hard for them to carry out their agenda um, because he's just such an asshole and psychopath. <laughs> However, I think that maybe domestically you could argue that his policies are, are maybe failing. But look, I mean, the Republicans control both both houses. We know Paul Ryan is a total sociopath who hates the poor. So he's going to keep trying over and over again until they really push these things through. But in terms of empire, holy shit, Trump is ramping that up. Big time. Yeah. Afghanistan troop surge is one of them. Somalia buildup um, of AFRICOM where you see, you know, that that horrific massacre um, that we thought was Al-Shabaab. And I don't know if they've actually found out if it was or not. But the same guy who did that, the U.S. had raided his village a couple of weeks prior and killed a bunch of kids. Mm. Then you have Trump's whole posturing on Saudi Arabia. That was his main thing. Hillary and Saudi Arabia. Well, you just fucking sold a shitload of mm -hmm. weapons to them. And now they're massacring a ton of Yemenis. Trump has increased drone strikes 450%. He's killed more civilians. I think there's like a 75% increase in civilian deaths. Yes, Obama was, you know, willy-nilly with this like deck of cards of, of who to assassinate mm -hmm. with drones. They were killing every military age male in a drone strike area. But now Trump's just carpet bombing villages with like entire families are being wiped out. Like really? straight up Israeli style massacres. Um, and you just read some of these statistics of, of what is going on with drones. And it is very frightening. I mean, he said it on the campaign trail. This is the one thing. <laughs> I'll give him credit. He did say that he was going to do this. He said that he was going to torture families, take them out, right? Mm -hmm. Take out terrorist families. Just a complete uh, violation of the Geneva Conventions. Right. And everyone just didn't care. And guess what? He's doing it. So what he's not doing is what I actually hoped he would do, which is normalizing relations with Russia. Yeah. He, he is doing everything... Like the like the few things that I thought he would do that I was hopeful about, he is totally fucking not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, we're talking about really crazy stuff. The Moab bomb, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. What the hell? He dusts off this like mini nuke, drops it on a village of ninety five thousand people, and just says, "Oh, it's on ISIS caves." And everyone's like, "Yeah!" Like everyone on CNN just loves it. Look, there are people that live there. There were people who were blocked from going to the site weeks after. We have no idea how many people died. All you say is ISIS caves were there and everyone's like, oh, great. Let's just kill them all. This dehumanization. Look, ISIS is a barbaric death cult. That doesn't give us the right to carpet bomb areas without knowing anything about what the hell is going on in the ground. So this complete just like dehumanization of what's going on in the Middle East is sickens me because I'm not a nationalist. I'm an internationalist. And, and knowing that we're just wiping out generations of families who are obviously going to grow up and say, huh, how did my entire family die? Oh, wait. But now Trump campaigned. And the reason why I think a lot of people, one of the reasons why a lot of people on the right far right supported him was because he claimed that he wanted to get us the hell out of the Middle East. And he kept saying over and over that we made a mistake. We're losing. It's tough. And so they thought he was going to be an anti-interventionist. Of course, now he's turned out to be the exact opposite. So how do you think, do you think that will hurt him actually? Or to, why do you think he's doing that? I mean, I know why he's doing that because the, every, the, all the mechanisms are in place to keep doing that, right? He, he can't stop this military industrial complex by himself at the, in, you know what I mean? And so, but how, how does that going to play out? You think with his base, like how does that help them going forward? Well, it's interesting. I thought more of his base, maybe because it's only the circles that I see are kind of in these circles that we're in. But I was hoping for more people to be speaking out against the fact that he has just ramped up uh, the deadliest and most murderous aspects of the empire. But I've realized, Jimmy, that I think it's more people who kind of are on board with like a more efficient war on terror. Because I don't hear these people speak out against Venezuela. I don't hear these people mm. really care about an impending war with North Korea. Um, I just hear, okay, we don't want to fund jihadist rebels in Syria and we want to work with Russia maybe to carry out a more efficient war on terror. So I feel like there's a lot of holes in that narrative. Plus, as much as Trump maybe spoke about not nation building and all this shit, he never really was an anti-interventionist. He just kind of 
tweeted off a couple of things and said what he knew people wanted to hear because he knew he had that against Hillary. Look, he didn't have to surround himself with generals. Like, uh. he surrounded himself with generals who are just mm. hard at the thought of leading another conflict so they can just get another star on their, right. like, jacket. I mean, these assholes are so removed from the situation on the ground. That's Trump's fault. Trump didn't have to do that. Trump didn't have to ramp up all the drone strikes. He didn't have to keep killing families and carpet bombing people. He didn't have to ramp up Afrikan's presence in, in Africa. So, you know, and then you have the Niger shit. I mean, it just yes. really shows you how much he gives a shit about, uh, about, <laughs> about that. But my whole thing was like, look, yes, it's bad. He didn't know the guy's name when he was apologizing to the family. But my question is, why aren't we saying, why are we in Niger? You know, well, like we're, we're in this year because we're fighting terrorism. Right. That, oh, right. So we're training their people to help fight terrorism. Right. That's the, so wherever there's, let's just have to say terrorism, and we have that blanket uh, you know, agreement from George Bush that we can fight terrorism anywhere in the world. So Congress uh, abdicates their responsibility to declare war, and this is why we have this empire yeah. happening, which is your show is so aptly named. Mm-hmm.